we're going to talk about basic approaches to soul winning and some things that hopefully will be able to help you out in your uh, endeavors. You know, different ways of approaching soul winning as far as styles of music, jazz, ballads, up tempo jazz, Latin, funk, rock. I don't know anything about country music. I don't know if I can help you very much with that. But, <laughs> but uh, all the other stuff, I played a lot. So I should be able to be of some assistance to you. Now, I think one of the most important things, and I talked about this in the earlier class, um, dealing with uh, vocal accompaniment, is approach. Let's do this. When you're playing a solo, any solo, jazz, whatever style of music, what you're trying to do is get from point A to point B. Now, you know, you could consider this, this is the entire solo. Let's just say uh, you're working with Miles Davis. Yeah. And Miles says, he comes up to you and he says, hey man, play, you know, play. So, <laughs> and so you go in and you play. And you've got X number of time, you know, you've got so much time before he comes over and touches your arm and tells you to quit playing, you know, to go between here and there. Now, what are you going to do? You say, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I don't know what to do. So, but you have a knowledge of chords to a degree. I mean, you know basically a C major 7 from a C minor 7, diminished, augmented, or whatever. Now, you can break this up into segments, okay, into smaller phrases. This is like the whole enchilada, okay? So that's got to have a, a flow. There has to be something. Maybe you want to start here and build it up to ah, right? Or you want to start big ah, and build it, bring it down to something real minute, real soft. Then maybe you want to make it uh, do some weird things in the middle. You know, you want to have it jerky or something or, or, or rhythmic. You know, da -da 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 -da. but still you're thinking about phrasing. What you got to do is get first to say A2. Doesn't look like an A, does it? But it is. So let's say that's the first phrase. That's the first thing you're going to do. Then the next event you're going to do will take you to, for lack of a better thing, let's just say A3. You're going to go to there. Then we're going to start a new idea. Let's say we're sick of that. Okay. So we're going to start. Oh, what can I put? <laughs> Any letter. Actually, I should put C here maybe, right? That makes more sense. Does that look like a C? Okay. So let's say this is B. Now we're starting a new idea. Then we got to get to B1. Further development of that idea. And then, let's say we're sick of that. We're going to start with something else. Maybe I should make this D. <laughs> okay. So we go to D. So I'm going to say C, and then we have C1, and then that's it. We've reached our conclusion. So we've got three events here in your solo. Now, I'm not saying that you have to consciously sit there and say, okay, I'm playing this phrase, and now I've got to switch to A2, now I've got to switch to A3, and now I changed my idea. No. I mean, basically, you're, you're thinking sort of, uh, oh, this is all emotional. But... If you can sort of get in the frame of mind of compositionally constructing your solos, it's going to make a world of difference in your playing and in your musicianship. You, you, I mean, you become the new day Bach. You become Stravinsky. I mean, you are them. You're creating at the moment, and uh, except it's all improvised. Well, Bach used to improvise, right? So what you're do dealing with is phrasing. So we got one idea, two ideas. Three ideas. Now let's do this. Let's make a solo just like that. Okay. I'm going to change the song because I'm tired of that thing I played in the last <laughs> thing. Let's just take one chord. Let's make it real simple. How about F to just to change the key? F minor. Okay? Okay. Let's say it's all... He comes over, he says, solo. He says, uh-oh, what am I going to do? Okay, how about starting over with an idea like... Does it 
start, right? Now, let's make this a little more complex. How about making a little motif, right? Let's try this. Now you say, now what am I going to do? I can't keep playing that over and over again, right? You say, okay, I'm sick of that. Right now, I'm at A. But at least I'm at A. I got a little melody. Now let's go to A1. We need to build something on that. Same motor, right? I sort of made it a little longer thing, the same rhythmic pulse. Everything is sort of moving along real nice. Now, but you can't stay there. Say, what am I going to do now? You set up one event where you said, first event, second event. At a certain point in time, your body or your audience or the band leader is going to let you know that's enough. And <laughs> usually the audience is going to say, okay, it's time to move on and you can play something else. So then you, you got to hook up some kind of way of linking this with A3. Let's say we're going to continue that. How about this? A1. A2. I'm moving along right now. Got an A3. Now what I've done is taken the same motif, da da, di da da. Then I changed the melody a little bit, da di da da, and I intermixed them a little bit. And now all of a sudden the third event is I'm shortening the time span. I'm making it a little more agitated. So I feel like I want to. It'll push me in to the next phrase I'm going to start. Okay, so I'm going da da di da 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 as A. Now I got to go into the second event. Now I need to go to the third event. Each time the rhythmic impulse is getting a little faster. Now it's at the right point in time. See, if you guys time this right, I mean, by the time you get to B, Already, your audience is talking about, whoa, because you've taken them from here to there, and you just didn't do it by playing A. Because if you play that, say, over a 16-bar period, you might tend to get a little bored, right? So we built up into B. Now we've got to B, right? Okay, we're in, the, in this pattern going, da, 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 da. Now what I'm going to do. I should do. Well, we're dealing with one chord now. <laughs> now we can't, we've had A. So let's try something else. We built up, maybe we need to start over somewhere else. So now I'm playing another melody. Right? Now I'm into another melody. That's not the same as da. Now I'm doing da. Still melodic, and now I'm in B. Now I need to develop that idea. Now, okay. How about a little? How about something like that, just falling off the phrase? You know, this is just all off the top of my head now, I'm just thinking, okay? So we've got, now we've gotten to B1. We're almost through. Now, this, the problem with the thing so far, so far it was real nice and neat, but we haven't gone anywhere. Now, one little trick that gets them every time 
is that once you, you know, because repetition is the key to all of this. This really, really, really makes this stuff work. You do, you've sort of developed your, your A idea. You've sort of developed your B idea. You, and then you did a little fall off. Okay, now we need to go somewhere else. This thing needs to explode. Maybe we should do something rhythmic. You know what I'm saying? I mean, break the rhythm of, you've been playing legato a lot. Suppose we said we did uh, a... <laughs> okay, now we got C, the basic idea for C. <laughs> Something like that. You see what I'm saying? Let's put all three of them together. Now, I haven't developed C yet, because let's leave that for the last. We don't know where we're going to go with this thing. But we've got to come up with something that's going to make this thing explode at the end, right? So now, if I can remember all three of these sections, <laughs> let's see. Hmm. OK, the first one was, or something like this. Oh, yeah. What I decided to do is, let's really get crazy. Change the chords a little bit. It's all F. A little push beat on the end. Helps me round it out. And I'm at D. I'm finished. Well, I mean, I'm finished with the first half of Soul. Let's say. <laughs> so, basically what we've done. Where is the, uh, oh, there it is is we thought relatively compositionally. You can think even more compositionally in this. This is real basic. When you say we're going from A, first idea, develop that idea, develop it a little more, start a new idea right there, do a little development on that, and then we need a break. See, the thing is, is that solos, you have to realize where something needs to change. You know, you got, it's a sort of, it's like a clock in you that sort of says, that's enough of this, you know? And <laughs> basically what will break that up is if you've been doing something legato here, in order to, to change your solo around and make it go to the next plateau, you want to change the rhythmic impetus over here, make something different, or vice versa. If you start off rhythmically, the way to break off your solo later on to make it more interesting is go legato. Or you can completely uh, construct your soul. See, there's a lot to do. It's not just not limitation. It's too much. It's like, what are you going to take out of all of this grab bag worth of stuff to do? You know? And um, we're going to get specific about certain things. This is the key to everything. This is, say, 32 bars. Let's just say that's like 32 bars. Then you may want to start on something else. You start all over again. Let's just say this is the first 32 bars. Start off being the whole soul, but now I'm changing it. <laughs> it's my prerogative, right? Okay, so let's say that's 32 bars. Now you start with a new idea. D. Go somewhere totally different. Do the same type of progression until the end of your solo. You know, the, the one thing that's kind of weird is that, um, and you got to know how, you in, how to end your solos, too. You know, because it's real important to have the end of it, like, it depends on where you start. It has shapes. Similar to what I was talking about with Frank Zappa when he thinks in terms of shapes. If you think in terms of your entire solo doing this, hello, doing this, yeah, 
and then and then it goes way up here and then it comes down okay so basically what you've got here is you've got something that starts off here it's getting a little intense comes back a little bit you maybe start a new phrase come here it gets real agitated and then bang right on the top of the phrase like if you were holding something like right at that point if at the end of a phrase point it was just then you hit that downbeat, and it's like, you'd be amazed. I've done it live so much to just know people just go berserk if you time it right. And that means waiting to the end of the phrase point, don't, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to use that word. Don't, you know, don't, you, you have to use patience. <laughs> don't let it come too soon. It's just when you get to that point, bam, then you'll know it, and everything happens together. And if the musicians are working with you, there's nothing better. I don't, you know, somewhat. <laughs> okay, and then we move on in the solo. It may come back down. You may decide that this should be the end of your solo, but some people tend to, uh, you know, you may be through with your solo and they let you keep playing. You know, that's kind of a drag, but that does happen a lot. I want to play something for you. Something I did with Anita Baker over in uh, Montreux, Switzerland, last year. And it's got, she did a jazz ballad. So I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. We did, I played a solo, it's all live. And uh, I'm going to talk about it after you hear it. Okay? Anita Baker. you get. <laughs> I know you want to hear a saying, but you know, that'll be out directly. You know, we're working on a record together over there. Okay. Um, now, what did I decide to do? She had been singing this song and the audience was into it. Believe me. They were in and she was singing and it was real slow, real peaceful. Everybody sitting, sitting there sipping there, whatever. And words, you know, and I comes time for my solo. So I decide, let's keep it down, keep it soft. And I start off with a lick. Just that. Now I said, I need some repetition here, because repetition does it every time. You know, and so I decide to do. And then I do. I decide not to play a melody. Let me just do that. I just felt like doing it at the moment, so I just said. That alone sets up that entire solo. It really does, because I could have done and developed that idea, right? But I chose not to, so I broke what I was just talking about. <laughs> it's okay, it's my prerogative, I guess. But Sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes you just can't follow that kind of thing. So I decided to deal with repetition. Now let's talk about repetition just a little bit. Several things I did, and I'll get back to that solo. When you're dealing with, um, with repetition, the main thing is if you... Say I did the same solo. I'm not playing the changes, but I'm showing you what I'm talking about. Okay? Basically, it's the same motif over and over again. That's the classic way to do it. Now, there's one thing I want to show you just before I deal with this repetition. Uh, it's Miles Davis. You ready back there? They're always ready. And I'm going to show you exactly how this works. Miles Davis is another thing I did with Miles. Check this out. And we'll talk about it all at
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that myself. Okay. Yeah, I think I might want to do that. Matter of fact, would you go back to the beginning of that clip, and I just want, and I'll stop you, and okay, and I just want to explain one thing. I'll tell you when to start it. Basically, what I was doing with that situation is the groove was moving along, right? You know, and so I didn't have to play a lot right away. I said the groove had it. I didn't have to do much, so I decided I could have just played dunk, 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 which is almost similar to what I did. One, you know, I started off with. Play it, and, I'll, and you'll see. And then I'll, I'll tell you when to stop it, okay? A2. A3. Stop. Now, that right there is exactly A, A2, and A3. Okay? Actually, it should be A1 and A2, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You understand what I'm talking about. Those are three sections I took. And I started messing around with that lick because it felt good to me, and I didn't want to change up, you know? And so now, by the time I feel I've worn that lick out, you know, it's about as far as I can go, then I move on to something else, which is another motif. Okay, now I'm into something else. That was B. Okay, so we started off with something like that. And then I started, off, I started with another lick, which is B. And I can't play that anymore than that. And so I said, it's time to get out of this, so let me do a little lick. And I, and I go into a repetition, one of these things like I did on Anita's thing, which is... Stop. Okay, so what I needed was a way to get out of there. I'm doing this real quick. <laughs> Hope you're with me. Okay, I decided to play one of those flurries, you know, one of those Jan Hammer flurries. Where, you know, you guys play that all the time, right? Everybody play, plays that thing now. Just something that was, you know, it sounds more complicated than it really is, you know. <laughs> so he goes, you know, Stanley Clark, for example, you know how he gets in those things where he starts, do, he builds his solo and he starts doing these flurries and pretty soon it's going, bang. And then at the end you get that, that big push, you know, into the next phrase and everybody goes, oh. Phrasing is everything. It really, really is in the way you put that stuff together. So we've got three elements in this solo already, right? A, something like that, to B, which was just a derivative of that, which was just let the rhythm have it. At the end of that, I did, I started going into one of those even before the end of the phrase. You know, I can't, uh, I don't, on the piano, I don't have a pitch band, so I can't, okay, I did one of those little flurries, now, and then C, play from there. Okay, so then it went on and on. Basically, I was showing you the beginning of a solo. I tell you, it's a good way to start is building whatever solo you're going to do on a motif, no matter what it is. If you're in that figure, it could have been, I mean, that could be a start. But at the end of the phrase, I'm doing a little da -da 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 and then it could just sit there for again. I don't need to play because the rhythm is playing. Now, what if we break it up and decide when we go to B, rather than doing something melodic, let's do something rhythmic. Something like that or just one of those. All, you know, just nothing. What it is, 
is it's emotion. That's all it is. And, and I do something sometimes, it doesn't even a lot of times have anything to do with music. It's, it has to do with what effect it's going to have. Because music is all based on textures. And so this, is a, this, this creates a different texture. This. You know, especially if it's at the end of a phrase. Bang! We hit it and it's like, whoa! You know, and that's the kind of stuff I love. And then the rhythm can settle again and you can start a new idea. It's really, it's really great. Play that other Miles Davis piece. One thing I want to mention about that, one right after that. This was all done at the Montreux Jazz Festival, by the way. I know these are all real short pieces. It's hard to, to, to get into them sometimes. But basically, what I was trying to do there is, is obviously leave some space, and we were dealing with electric instruments, which are a little different with this, but the principle is all the same, is, is that if you can start with a central idea, if I'm starting with I should build on that idea. If I start on then I should build a phrase on that idea, generally speaking. Now, with the, uh, for example, with the... Um, Anita Baker thing, I broke that a little bit because I, I started off with a and then because I wanted to break what she had set up. I didn't want to get people to say, okay, well, I know what he's going to do. Da, 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 and it becomes real predictable. So I decided not to do that. Sometimes you want to be predictable and sometimes you don't want to be predictable. Okay. Um, there's one thing. Let me just see. I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. Oh, I, the, the, there is one other thing, too, um, which relates to everything. It relates to whether you're accompanying vocalists or, or playing solos, is that you have to listen to the band around you. Even if you're playing a solo, you have to be aware of what they're doing, and they should really be aware of, of what you're doing. I used to work with a band, um, with the Frank Zappa band, with the Mothers of Invention, and there was one particular band there that did something that no other band that I've been in does. I mean, they, it was the one with Chester Thompson. I don't know if you're familiar, but it was the one with Chester Thompson. We did this record called Roxy and Elsewhere and a couple of other things. And uh, Ruth Underwood was playing uh, percussion and stuff like that. This band with Chester Thompson on drums, who's now with Genesis, Tom Fowler on bass, it was, a good, it was one of those bands that was classic because everybody listened. Because you never knew what Frank was going to do. So you had to really be aware. And so what you really got to do is build up your awareness of what's going on around you and play off of each other, copying even. You know, in the middle of your solo, you may hear the drummer play something. The drummer may go, bop. You know, that might be a perfect occasion for you to go, bop. You know, say, play off what they're doing. The bass player may go in, in the middle of something like, was Say he does whatever he does, then you might want to say, you know, copy what he's doing just for a second. Doesn't mean you have to follow everything that he's doing, but he may hit on an emotional moment that you can capture and make a thing out of, which is what you want to do, or vice versa. If you do something like that, you may want him to catch what you're doing. Now, that's very valuable. Because uh, that means there's a lot of interplay going on with what you're doing. And that's what improvisation is all about. Except at one point, I know one point in music that got a little weird there, where I, I, was told, <laughs> I was told by this one musician, I said, man, I just don't understand what this music is. You know, and it, what it was was basically, not to say I don't like it, it's not my thing. Where <laughs> you know, some of that stuff. You know, and I've done my share of that, you know, uh, in, in the past. But um, he told me that he, the, the very idea was not to relate. And I said, whoa. 
I said, that was deep. That was deep. I mean, think of it. I said, I said, oh, I miss this. I said, all my life, I've tried to learn how to play with people. Now you're telling me if we're on the stage together, we don't really have to play together. He says, yeah. I said, that was something different. But I mean, I'm always open. You know, I mean, that's valid, I guess. You know, it's just, uh, for, for me, it wasn't very valid at the, at the time. I just didn't understand it. Because I think the whole idea of playing music is to play together. I mean, you can play alone and have a wonderful time. And a lot of people um, who are soloing or learning how to play in bands now play very well by themselves. But they have trouble playing with other musicians because either their time is funny or they just, you know... Sometimes the styles don't mix, or, or there's a variety of reasons that this doesn't work. But some kind of way, first of all, if you're going to work with somebody else, um, and I'm getting away from improvisation just for the moment, because this is important. Um, comping, when you're playing. You know, if you're going to play a solo, let's just say you're playing a jazz thing. I mean, let's just say, let's say it's one of these. You know, one of those kind of things. I'm not going to play the bass part. I mean, just the little things you do like that. You know, little something like that. What you do in the left hand means a lot to what you're doing in the right hand. If you're comping for somebody, if you're doing... The chords that you play, the voices that you play, they're all important and they relate to the other guy that you're playing with. You know, you understand what I'm saying? How do you get to that point? That's what you guys want to know, huh? Okay, now, there's several different ways of arriving at this thing. I would say that if you're going to work with somebody else, um, whether you're soloing or just playing with somebody else, let's just say basically working with someone else, you need to learn how to play in time. And that means sitting there, of course, with that metronome. It's a lot easier now because you've got drum machines. So you can sort of feel something. I mean, I noticed when I was coming up, there was nothing but that <laughs> which used to drive me crazy. You know, because there was no, I couldn't feel anything. But now, with the advent of a drum machine, which going I mean, you're still like, hey, okay. So, and I'm not talking about playing sequences and having your, what you play justified. I mean, normally sitting down there playing with a drum machine can definitely help you out if the pattern is simple enough where you can hear the beat, you know? And uh, some people, uh, I had one guy here in the last uh, seminar who said that he was taught to pat his foot on one and three. You know, whatever works for you, do it. Because you, if you're going to play with somebody else, you've got to learn how to play in time. And most... Most uh, funk, rock players, stuff like that, tend to rush. I was one of those. I mean, if a band started playing, I was rushing automatically. You know, I mean, it's like if the tempo was here, I'd be talking about, duh, 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 you know, duh, duh, duh. I was agitated, you know, because I won't, I, it was just, it took me a long time to settle down and sometimes learn how to play behind the beat. Because sometimes this stuff, especially in, in certain jazz or funk things, you want to play behind the beat. You don't really want to play on top of the beat. Now, certain things, uh, of course, you do want to play. You want that edge. You want to play a little bit on top. But when you're working with somebody else, you're working with a drummer, you've got to be able to, rate to hit, relate to his or her feel, you know, playing drums. And it's going to vary, too, because they're not a metronome. Now, if they know how to play in time, you're in better shape. If they don't... Then, then you got another, maybe both of you need to sit down with a drum machine or, or a metronome and play. So I think timing is, is uh, learning how to play with other people very much is involved with, with uh, learning how to play on the beat. And you can practice that in different tempos. You know, it's not that hard to do because my time was not that good when I first started playing, believe me. You know, I mean, I could play a little bit, but my time basically was not perfect. Still isn't. You know, I tend to like to play behind the beat, though. Meaning, if the beat was here, duh, duh, if this was right on the beat, I might play just a little, just a little bit behind the beat. That kind of stuff, rather. That's a different feeling, then. You know, it's a different. You 
you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, and it's attitude. Getting back to attitude again. That's jazz. If I'm dealing with rock and roll or funk, I'm playing a totally different attitude and thinking about uh, totally different things. Okay, so can we see this other piece? There's a duet that I have with Robin Ford where I'm showing you sometimes when you're playing a solo or you're playing with somebody else, you know what I mean? Playing with Miles Davis could be kind of intimidating, you know, because you never know what he's going to do. And he's, you know, he'll walk up and tell you, you know, first thing he did when I went on the stage is he called me out on the stage and I went out to sit in and I went there and he, and I went to play and he put his hand, he says, <laughs> I said, geez, okay. So he didn't want me to play right then. And then uh, pretty soon he said, you know, he said, he took his hand and he said, you know, I said, okay. And so I went and played. And the first thing I did, I was looking around trying to figure out what was happening. And uh, I went over to play with Robin Ford. Now we, you know, we, we'll play it and we'll talk about it. fun. I wish I could play more than that, but you know. Anyway, um, basically what we were doing was looking at each other and playing, and I was sort of challenging him a little bit. You know, I said, come on, Robin, you know, let's go. And, uh, and he, obviously, you know, Robin is up to it. He's a great player. So um, pulling the beat, that's what I want. That's what was going on in that solo. You know, basically, there were a lot of times I would start off at one tempo and pull the beat back. It's not necessary all the time to do. I mean, play everything in time. Well, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. It's not necessary to play in time all the time. Sometimes it's nice to pull the beat back a little bit. You know, if you start off with a lick. That creates another tension. If you're, you know, from... Especially if you're getting to the end of a phrase point rather than going the other way, you know, uh, keeping everything all even. It really depends. Everything I'm saying today is obviously relative, you know, to, to the situation that's going on around you. So sometimes it's nice to pull that back and maybe even go into something like a triplet figure. You know, or in the advent of somebody like Chick Corea, who, who plays a lot in time, that you know, stuff that I can't play, then he'll, he'll do the, you know, he'll end it with a... with something rhythmic. You know, so there we come back to that advent of breaking up what you're doing with certain melodic elements and certain rhythmic elements. You know, which is nice. i tell you what I really want to do. I want to talk about chords, chords. Look, I can't even say it chords and voicings and uh, certain, you know, little tricks and things you can do. Now, we've already gone through this, this uh, you know, the motif thing. You've got to remember that because that's, that's, your, that's your ace in the hole. If you're not inspired one night and you just can't figure out what to play, you've always got this bag of tricks that you can call upon, and it's always there, and you can rely on it. You say, well, I know I can play... I could be bored still, but still I know I can construct a solo where it'll make some kind of sense using that. A, A2, A3, B, and C, and building up my phrases that way. You've always got those little things you can call upon, including... Hey, that's one little trick I got. I got uh, the rhythmic thing. Big block chords, gets them every time. Another little bag of tricks is doing like... The piano player, you know, those guys sit there and say, until you figure out what you're going to play. <laughs> you know, 
vamp till ready, sort of, you know. You know, another thing that gets over real well is simple repetition, such as... Simple. Just one note. That, well, a little... You know, but I didn't have to do that. Or you could hit... so on. So you can set up your solo that way. If I'm just not inspired one night, I might just say, okay. <laughs> say, okay. <laughs> so that's another one I got. And you get all these little, little motifs and little things that you know you can do. I mean, I have another one that used to astound people. It's not that hard to play, but it's something that I could always call upon. It was like, uh, for example, you know that. It's not that hard to play. Technically, it's not that rough because it's just fourth chords, you know, going up. And we'll get into that because I know I already had a request about that. But playing, you know, that was like, whoa, what is that? And I learned early on, I said, man, I'm going to get a bunch of these little things and I'll practice them till I can play them. You know, and I can always pull it out at a certain point and create, like, a, the end of a phrase point that was just magnificent, you know, and all of us do it. All of us. Me, Herbie, Chick, all, any piano player that you respect that's a great piano player, they all have these little tricks. Oscar Peterson, he's got his, you know, I don't, what is, I can't play like Oscar, so I'm not going to even try. <laughs> but, he's, but he's got these little, uh, you know... That kind of stuff. Every piano player has those little things. Those things, which he could, you know, in his youth he practiced them. Like, you know, till, you know. Now it's just, it's just nothing to play it. And you have these little licks, things like that, little technical things that sort of astound people. Always, uh, always seems to work. Another one that I use extensively. The end of phrase points, man, I'd hit that, and, and, and it's amazing what emotional effect it has. So you find those. Uh, I found another one on the synthesizer, just one note, holding a note. Sometimes it's not necessary to play a lot of notes. Sometimes one note, similar to this. Sometimes, I mean, I used to hear um, just one note, just, you know, well, I'm not going to try to sing it, but just that alone would just take the music somewhere else, especially if it's come out of a, of a space where there's a lot of stuff going on in front of it. Now, how can we make this chord interesting? There's a way to take, for example, besides adding sevenths, we can do that, the seventh of the chord. Okay, or whatever scale you're dealing with. Now, let's say, on top of that, we could add the ninth. We're going to add the 11th, 13th, so on, until you get back up to the top. So we're dealing with a basic triad. We're adding the minor 7th, the 9th, the 11th, the 13th. Nice chord. And a very basic voicing that works, that will work in different keys. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Now, if you don't want to go that far, far, <laughs> then <laughs> I'm having trouble talking now. Then you'll take out, say, some of those, the 13s. You may just want an 11th chord. Now, there are other ways of voicing this chord that are also interesting. This is very basic, you know, you're starting with a, a root position chord. Now, suppose we move some of these notes around. Let's open this chord up a little bit to say something like this. It's the same chord. Is that, but it's a different vibe, you know, even up here. Now, what you've got essentially, I move the root down an octave, put the fifth in there, took this, moved it down an octave, took the ninth, moved it down an octave, 
So I got this. Left the third where it was. Left the seventh where it was. And the ninth where it was. I just opened the chord up. Instead of putting this here, I just moved it down an octave. And the effect is this to this. Hear that? And that also works in different keys. Some of them are too much for me to reach. But okay? Nice voicing. Real nice open voicing. Now, you can also tighten that up. And we're dealing basically with fifths. See, because uh, you're turning it into... It's almost like stacking one thing on top of another, but it's still an F minor 11, okay? Now let's, let's take this and close the chord up a little bit. From this, let's bring the B flat down. The way you close it up, you just start bringing the notes in. So now we got this. Hey, now we got three different voicings for the same chord, which you can use in the space of two, uh, in, in the space of one quarter note. Let's say if the tempo was like this, you could do, hey, your music's more interesting already, rather than, if you're doing one, two, three, suppose you had the availability of doing one, two, three, you know, moving them around a little bit, you know, and that's all we do, as, as, you know, those are all the chords that I just gave you based on this, chord two and chord three, okay? And you can do that in different keys. You don't have to just stay in that key. If you add this, move it up a step, works the same way. Chord one, chord three, okay? And it's this tension right here that gives you that thing. And then you can get into adding other notes and closing them up even more that kind of stuff, you know. Okay, so you, you got that? That's dealing with fifths. Fifths give you a certain sound, you know, that's very open. It's that kind of lush, you know, what, what, what do you want to call it? What's the name of this guy? Anyway, it's very lush and uh, rem it's reminiscent of Ravel and that kind of stuff. And C. right, that kind of thing. Now, you can also deal with four, fourth chords, which are very open, but they don't tie you down as much as the fifths even. So I can think of ways to play fifths, which aren't very, you know, they don't tie you down. But the fourth chords are real interesting to me because, and I, what I mean by fourths is you start anywhere, and a perfect fourth up from that or down will give you a nice sound. And you can go on. Here's that sort of modern sound, you know. And the good thing about fourths in the middle of a song is that they can go anywhere and when you're improvising is real important because if you're doing you know if you're on one chord now I just move this around it's all, all G now I'm not moving my scales around the solo that I'm playing on top is all G minor the only thing that's moving and making the solo sound like it's going somewhere when it's really not are the chords. All perfect chords. Okay? Now all that is, is... Okay. The only thing that's changing is this. It's McCoy Tyner. He made a living out of doing this, right? Of playing those kind of chords. Okay? So that's an interesting thing, and it also can be used. It's not just jazz. You can use what I'm saying now in any kind of music, because it, the music is so open now, that, uh, and I'm glad to see it. Um, that uh, you can use virtually any to any of these techniques in each other's music, you know, pop music, rock, jazz, and it makes the stuff more interesting. I mean, some of the stuff say that, uh, well, 
you know, Genesis and, 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 and it was real interesting to me, you know, the way this stuff is put together, you know. And just to name one, but there are a lot more. Okay, so if you use a fourth chord, a big chord that's used a lot is basically a fourth voicing with a third on the top. So you got to say basically, it's sort of D minor, but it's not minor. It doesn't, there's no third, so it doesn't lock you down. Though this has a third, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you say, okay, this is D, but the bass player could easily go to A. That same chord, he could play B flat. It could become a B flat chord. It could be a C chord. See what I'm saying? It could be G chord. F, E flat. And that's the value of these chords, of just those three little notes, is that they can be almost anything. Now, if you put a third on top, a third interval on top from, say, say you have four fourths starting, say, a D, fourth up, another fourth up, another fourth up, and then you put a third on top, that narrows you down a little bit. It's almost like that uh, Freddie Hubbard song that goes, you know, you know that. Okay, that's all based on fourths. Now, that can be moved around too, right? Just like the other fourths can be done, can be moved around. But that gives you a little more solid thing rather than just this. Instead of that, you've got, hear the difference? And then you can put the root on top. Or all I did there was just move the seventh up. The options are endless. And I just feel like once I get into this area, it's like, one thing leads to another, and it's like there's so much, you know, that it gets insane to even start trying to explain it. But basically, if you're aware that you've got those intervals to work with in the middle of your songs, even if, on a simple introduction that's like E minor, you could do... See, that chord opens up another realm of possibility, especially with the third on top. You know, the third interval on top starting from the root. As soon as you hit that third, which is the G, put the fifth in there, that locks it down to be an E minor triad. Instead of down there, it puts it up there. And then you got those other two notes in there. It's a real interesting chord. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, it gets real deep. <laughs> okay? Now, if you, if I take that, Fourth chord, fourth chord, you know, and now I touched on these dominant chords a, a, a few minutes ago, too. Um, I probably should talk about that a little bit. Is there anything that you want to ask about those fourth chords? And I would suggest that what you should do, actually, is, is um, experiment with them. That's the best way for you to do it, is really just experiment with using those chords. Move them to different places, find out what works. Like on an F, right away, at the instead of using at the beginning of your chord, you could use. Now the first tune we started with a few minutes ago, we were building it up like this. F minor triad, adding the seventh, adding the ninth, adding the eleventh. That's one where you could do that, but you could also make it a fourth oriented chord, which I call, which is like this. From that to this. Now you've added another chord to your repertoire. Besides having the this to the open chord, to the closed chord, to the fourth chord. Now you got four different voicings to work with that work all over the keyboard. So you got, let me do it again. You've got your straight minor 11th. You've got the open minor 11th, which you're just taking this note, F, C, and G, moving them down an octave. So you've got a fifth chord, you know, chord of open fifths, chord, chord of open fourths. Hear that? To a tight chord, which is basically the same thing as this. The only thing you're doing is moving the top ninth 
uh, the type 11, excuse me, down an octave and making it a fourth, moving it right inside. So now, in the space of one measure, you got four things you can do, right? You've got that's three. Here we go four. There's four. Now you've increased your vocabulary a lot, and you can do that in different keys. You know, you know. I'm saying it it, it works in every key. You, know, you leave notes out, even that. That's a nice voice too. Let me show you that one. Well, okay. <laughs> this, this goes on. This is endless. Okay. In closing. Keep at it. I mean, you guys could do it. I expect to see you as the, the new wave of uh, keyboardists out there. And uh, remember, the main thing that you can do is, is you've got to practice. You've got to practice. Try all these things in different keys, and don't be afraid to experiment, because experimentation is what's going to take you to the next level and make you different than the guy next door or make you different than me. If you can take what I told you today and take it to the next level that I don't even know about, hey, man. That's what we want you to do, okay? Good luck.